Part 3 Ways and Means Skillful Means The hindrances do not appear in the mind as the result of meditation. Rather, it is that meditation reveals hindrances that are already latent within the mind, but which are difficult to isolate and deal with effectively in daily life. Meditation might be compared to putting the mind under a microscope in order to see the harmful viruses, invisible to the naked eye, that are threatening its health. Lung Po reminded his disciples that encountering the hindrances in meditation should not be a source of discouragement. In dealing with the hindrances, meditators were getting to know how the mind worked and how to deal with it most effectively. He said that meditators should be constantly observing and reviewing what worked in their meditation and what did not. They should treat their mind as parents did a child, expressing a measured appreciation and encouragement when it did well, being consistently firm and fair when it needed admonishment. The untrained mind was like a willful child that followed its moods and often got into mischief. The meditator was not to smother the mind with overly close attention, but to keep a constant eye on it wherever it might go, and prevent it from falling into danger. Learning from mistakes and being creative in finding ways to deal with problems that arose in meditation were good things. At the same time, care should be taken not to develop so many skillful means that the essential simplicity of the practice was forgotten and more harm done than good. Physical pain. Sometimes you may break out in a sweat. Big beads as large as corn kernels rolling down your chest. But when you've passed through painful feelings once, then you will know all about it. Keep working at it. Don't push yourself too much, but keep steadily practicing. Physical discomfort arising during sitting meditation can range from a dull ache to cramps to agonizing pain. As the discomfort is dependent upon the meditator's choice of posture, he or she has the power to bring it to an end by moving. The question arises as to whether the meditator in pain should change posture, and if so, at which point. Lung Po's usual advice was that meditators should not move out of a reactivity bred from fear or anxiety. At first, they should attempt to turn attention from the pain by repeatedly returning to the meditation object. If that became impossible, meditators should take the physical sensation of pain itself as their meditation object. In the case that mindfulness was still not strong enough to deal with the pain, then the meditator should change posture. Lung Po cautioned his disciples, giving to pushing the limits of their endurance, to ensure that their enthusiasm was always governed by wisdom. Too much willful endurance of physical pain in meditation by a beginner could gradually lead to a sense of dreariness, an aversion to practice, or in extreme cases, a visit to the doctors. On some occasions, Lung Po urged disciples to persevere right through the dark tunnel of painful feeling and emerge on the other side. Meditators who can endure pain to a point at which it reaches a crescendo and then dissolves, experience a great rapture and enter a deep state of calm. Having gone beyond painful feeling in this way, meditators' fear of pain and thus of death is usually much diminished. Even more importantly, the natural separation of the physical feeling of pain and the awareness of it provides a profound understanding of the impersonality of feeling. The realization of how much of what was assumed to be physical pain is in fact the instinctive emotional reaction to the pain and that it can be released through mindfulness can be the grounds for a significant breakthrough in practice. The Right Approach In its most elevated form, Banya manifests as the penetrative insight into things as they are, 
which eliminates the defilements generating suffering and constitutes the culmination of the Buddha's path to liberation. But the same training which achieves its consummation through wisdom also begins with wisdom. At this initial stage, it is referred to as mundane right view. Its most important feature is a conviction in the law of Gamma and the human capacity for liberation through practice of the Eightfold Path. Lung Po devoted a great deal of time to correcting the misguided views and false assumptions that could lead meditators astray. Time and time again, he sought to clarify the principles of right view, which he called the cool place where all heat and agitation cease. One persistent wrong view involved a belief that the causal process leading to liberation could be bypassed by means of a certain technique or skillful means. Lung Po's insistence on kanti or patience as the fundamental virtue in practice of the Buddha's path meant he gave short shrift to people impatient for results. When a lay meditator asked him for a shortcut, he replied, If that's what you want, you might as well just forget about the whole thing. On another occasion, he said, If the causes are insufficient, the results will fail to appear. It's natural. For liberation to take place, you must be patient. Patience is the leading principle in practice. Speaking to a group of lay meditators, he said, Meditating in order to realize lucid calm is not the same as pressing a switch and expecting everything to be immediately flooded with light. Putting forth effort in meditation is like writing out a sentence. You can't omit a single one of its words or phrases. All dhammas arise from causes. Results will only cease when their causes do. You must keep steadily doing it, steadily practicing. You're not going to attain or see anything in one or two days. You must try to put forth a constant effort. You can't comprehend this through someone else's words. You have to discover it for yourself. It's not how much you meditate. You can do just a little, but do it every day. And practice walking meditation every day as well. Irrespective of whether you do a lot or a little, do it every day. Be sparing with your speech and watch your mind the whole time. Keep refuting the perception of permanence in whatever arises in your mind, whether pleasurable or painful. Nothing lasts. It's all deceptive. How could it fail to be difficult to train the mind, he would say, when people had neglected to do so all their life up to that time, and probably for many lifetimes previously? The army of Dhamma was still vastly outnumbered by the army of defilements. It would take time to make the contest more equal. Rather than continually looking forward to a desired goal, like a child in a car asking again and again how much longer before they arrived. Meditators were encouraged to proceed steadily along their chosen path of practice, with attention to the quality of the effort that they were making, moment by moment. Meditators should trust that when causes were ripe, results would inevitably appear. The Buddha taught us to move forward, not too slowly, and not too fast, but to make the mind just right. There's no need to get worked up about it all. If you are, then you should reflect that practice is like planting a tree. You dig a hole and place the tree in it. After that, it's your job to fill in the earth, to put fertilizer on it, to water the tree and to protect it from pests. That's your duty. It's what orchard owners have to do. But whether the tree grows fast or slow is its own business. It has nothing to do with you. If you don't know the limits of your own responsibilities, you'll end up trying to do the work of the tree as well, and you'll suffer. All you have to do is see to the fertilizer, the watering, and keeping the insects away. The speed of growth of the tree is the tree's business. 
if you know what is your responsibility and what is not, then your meditation will be smooth and relaxed, not stressed and fretful. When your sitting is calm, then watch the calmness. When it's not calm, then watch that. If there's calm, there's calm. If there's not, there's not. You mustn't let yourself suffer if your mind's not calm. It's a mistake to rejoice when your mind is calm, or to mope when it's not. Would you let yourself suffer about a tree, about the sunshine or the rain? Things are what they are, and if you understand that, your meditation will go well. So keep travelling along the path, keep practising, keep attending to your duties and meditating at the appropriate times. As for what you get from it, what you attain, what calmness you achieve, that will depend on the potency of the virtue you have accumulated. Just as the orchard owner, who knows the extent of his responsibilities towards the tree, keeps in good humour, so, when the practitioner understands his duties in his practice, then just rightness establishes itself naturally. While Luang Po saw how important it was for his disciples to acquire a firm foundation of knowledge of the Buddha's teachings, he also warned against the detrimental effect of too much or unwise study. There are learned teachers who write about first absorption, jhana, second absorption, third absorption, fourth absorption and so on. But if the mind gets to the level of lucid calm, it's not aware of all that. All it knows is that what it's experiencing is not the same as in the books. If a student of the texts grasps on tightly to his knowledge, when he enters a state of lucid calm and likes to keep noting, what's this? Is this the first absorption yet? His mind will simply make a complete retreat from the calm and he'll get nothing from it. Why? Because he wants something. The moment there's craving to realize something, the mind pulls back from the lucid calm. That's why you've got to throw away all your thoughts and doubts and take only your body, speech and mind into the practice. Look inwardly at states of mind, but don't drag your scriptures in there with you. It's not the place for them. If you insist on it, then everything will go down the drain, because nothing in the books is the same as it is in experience. It's precisely because of this attachment to book knowledge that people who study a lot, who know a lot, tend to be unsuccessful in meditation. No ideas of gain Meditators were constantly reminded that they had embarked on a practice of renunciation and letting go. Seeking visions or psychic powers through meditation was to miss the point altogether. If a craving to gain or attain something took root in meditators' minds, then they had entered upon a path without ultimate resolution. The desire to realize some special experience might lead on to new elevated realms of existence, but not to liberation. Seeking rebirth in refined states of consciousness was like a bird flying deliberately into a gilded cage. At the beginning of practice, the best motto was to be cool, steady and patient. Unwise gaining ideas at this stage could lead to meditators giving up altogether. Sometimes in meditation practice, people make determinations that are too extreme. They light incense, bow and make a vow. As long as this incense has not burnt down, then I will not move from my sitting posture under any circumstances. Whether I fall unconscious or die, whatever happens, I'll die right here. As soon as they've made the solemn declaration, they start to meditate, and then, within moments, the Maras attack them from all sides. They open their eyes to glance at the incense sticks. Oh no, there's still loads left. They grit their teeth 
and start again. Their minds are hot and bothered and in a turmoil. They're at their wit's end. They've had enough and they look at the incense sticks again. Surely they must be at an end. Oh no, not even halfway. This happens three or four times and then they give up. They sit and blame themselves for being hopeless. Oh, why am I such an idiot? It's so humiliating and so on. They sit there suffering about being insincere and bad, all kinds of things, until their minds are in an utter mess, and then the hindrances arise. If this kind of effort doesn't lead towards ill will towards others, it leads to ill will towards yourself. Why? Because of craving. In fact, you don't have to take resolutions that far. You don't have to make the resolution to tie yourself up like that. Just make the resolution to let go. Progress in meditation is, for the most part, incremental. The gradually increasing dampness of a walker's coat in fog, as one Japanese master has put it, rather than its obvious drenching by rain. But there can also be periods of great intensity. At such times, desire for clear validation of their efforts leads many meditators to give an exaggerated importance to unusual meditative experiences that occur. The intense feelings of rapture that often accompany such experiences seem to confirm their significance. Luang Po's insistence that all experiences are ultimately of the same value, being equally liable to cause suffering to one who delights in them, was hard to grasp for meditators anxious to believe that all the work they had done was finally bearing fruit. If they did experience a notable shift in their practice, it could easily lead to new forms of conceit. Don't stick your nose up in the air on account of your practice. Don't make too much out of your experiences. Let things peacefully follow their course. Don't get ambitious. There's no need to crave to get or to become anything at all. On one occasion, a monk came to ask Lung Po why it was that despite putting great effort into his meditation, he had still never seen the lights and colors that others claimed to see. Lung Po replied, See light? What do you want to see light for? What good do you think it would do you? If you want to see light, go and look at that fluorescent lamp. That's what light looks like. When the laughter had died down, he continued, The majority of meditators are like that. They want to see light and colors. They want to see deities, heaven and hell realms, all those kinds of things. Don't get caught up with that stuff. Only the posture changes. A recurring theme in Luang Por's meditation instructions was the necessity to create a flow of mindfulness and alertness independent of posture. This was the only way that the necessary momentum needed to cut through defilements could be sustained. Meditation isn't tied to standing or walking or sitting or lying down. As we can't live completely motionless and inactive, we have to incorporate all these four postures into our practice. And the guiding principle to be relied on in each of them is the generation of wisdom and rightness, kwam tu dong. Rightness means right view and is another word for wisdom. Wisdom can arise at any time in any one of the four postures. In each posture, you can think evil thoughts or good thoughts, mistaken thoughts or correct thoughts. Disciples of the Buddha are capable of realizing the Dhamma whether standing, walking, sitting or lying down. So where does this practice, which is carried out in the four postures, find its focal point? It finds it in the generation of right view, because once there is right view, then there comes to be right resolve, right speech, and the rest of the Eightfold Path. 
Thus, it would be better to change our way of speaking. Instead of saying that we come out of samadhi, we should say merely that we change our posture. Samadhi means stability of mind. When you emerge from samadhi, then maintain that stability in your mindfulness and alertness, in your object, in your actions, all of the time. It's incorrect to think that at the end of a meditation session you finished work. Put forth a constant effort. It's through maintaining a constancy of effort in your work, in your actions, and in your mindfulness and alertness that your meditation will develop. The obstacles that arise during meditation practice change and evolve. The overall tendency is for the obstacles to become more subtle as the practice progresses. But meditators who forgot Luang Po's constant injunction to take nothing for granted could be blindsided by the unexpected reappearance of coarse defilements that they had assumed were behind them. One common mistake was to attach to goodness. This could manifest as irritation with the shortcomings of others, or else an exaggerated protectiveness of their peace of mind. Lung Po analyzed the fault. You're afraid that the mind will become defiled. Afraid that your samadhi will be destroyed. You feel a strong devotion to the practice, are strongly protective of it. You are very diligent and put forth a lot of effort. When a sense object impinges, then you're caught out and terrified by it. Luang Po reassured his disciples that this was a temporary stage that meditators passed through when there was an imbalance in the practice. It would fade away if they recognized that a certain amount of non-peaceful elements in a meditator's life were, in fact, the raw material for the work of wisdom. Psychic Powers On many occasions, the Buddha enumerated the various supernormal powers that were possible but not inevitable byproducts of deep meditation and the fact that they are essentially mundane. Their attainment bears no direct causal link to liberation. Of the two great disciples, Venerable Mahamogalana was acknowledged as foremost amongst all the monks who possessed psychic powers while Venerable Sariputta was never known to exhibit any at all. Although the Buddha praised Arahants who possessed such powers for having realized all that the human mind is capable of, he emphasized that such powers should never be made a goal of practice. Psychic powers such as telepathy may be of some use in teaching the Dhamma, but on the path to liberation, they are at best tangential, and at worst, obstacles to the realization of truth. There have always been a certain number of monks in the Thai forest tradition who have possessed psychic powers, although few have been willing to demonstrate or even speak about them. Indeed, the discipline only permits monks to reveal such abilities to fellow monks. The reason given for this injunction is that while people might be drawn to Buddhism by a display of miraculous powers, the faith that arises from exposure to the marvellous is not the kind that readily translates into the nurturing of wisdom that the Buddha wished to promote. In addition, a monk who reveals psychic powers will draw upon himself a great deal of distracting attention and thereby both hinder his own path to liberation and threaten the tranquility of the monastery in which he lives. Lung Po emphasized that the power of fascination irrespective of its object, is a serious obstacle to letting go. Fascination with psychic phenomena and unusual abilities binds the minds to samsara every bit as tightly as fascination with coarse sensual pleasures. The acquiring of psychic powers tends to lead to an overestimation of spiritual attainments and a lack of urgency in pushing on further to realize true liberation. In more intimate meetings with groups of monks, Luang Po would occasionally recount marvelous stories of the psychic powers of the Arahants, but afterwards he would make it clear that he had spoken for their information and enjoyment and repeated his warning. Don't pursue them. 
don't take any interest in them. On one occasion, during a conversation with a senior Sri Lankan monk, the talk turned to the subject of psychic powers. Lung Po was asked whether people in Thailand were interested in such matters. There are people who would like to acquire psychic powers. But myself, I feel that that kind of practice is not in agreement with the Buddha's teachings. The Buddha taught us to abandon every kind of greed, aversion and delusion. Those people's practice leads to the growth of those things. The Crust of Lucid Calm The word nimitta is usually rendered in Buddhist texts as sign. In the context of meditation, it refers to a mental phenomenon which is experienced as a sense perception arising as the mind goes beyond the hindrances. A nimitta is most commonly experienced as a visual form, less often as a sound or tactile sensation, and, rarely, as an odour or taste. In the path of purification, the Visuddhimagga, nimittas are treated at some length and divided into three categories. The Buddhist Dictionary by Venerable Jnana Tiloka, published in 1980, gives the following definition. The object perceived at the very beginning of concentration is called the preparatory image, parikamma nimitta. The still unsteady and unclear image, which arises when the mind has reached a weak degree of concentration, is called the acquired image, uggaha nimitta. An entirely clear and immovable image arising at a higher degree of concentration is the counter-image, Badibhaga nimitta. Entry into jhana is described as being dependent on the meditator shifting focus to a distinctive sign, most commonly a bright light that appears as samadhi deepens. Luang Po and his fellow forest masters were familiar with the treatment of nimittas in the path of purification, but rarely incorporated it in their accounts of the meditation process. They used the term nimitta with a slightly different emphasis. Luang Po employed it in speaking of the mind-made phenomena, colours, lights, visions of beings from other realms, that could appear as the mind became calm. He stressed the importance of maintaining the correct attitude to them. Known for what they were, nimittas were harmless. Obsessions with them could lead to a time-wasting detour and, in extreme cases, to psychosis. Armed with the awareness of their dangers, the basic method of dealing with them was simply to refuse to pay them any attention. Whatever form the nimitta takes, don't pay attention to it. While it still persists, re-establish your focus by putting all your attention on the breath. Breathe in and out deeply, at least three times, and that may well cut it off. Just keep re-establishing your concentration. Don't see it as being yours, it's merely a nimitta. Nimittas are deceivers. They make us like, they make us love, they make us fear. They're fake and they're unstable. If one arises, don't give it any significance. It's not yours. Don't chase after it. The most direct and powerful means of letting go of a nimitta was a change of focus from the perception to that which perceived it. When you see a nimitta, then shift attention to look directly at your mind. Don't abandon this basic principle. Visions could be alluring, and it was not possible for meditators to simply refuse to take pleasure in them by an act of will. What they could do was to immediately recognize any feelings of pleasure that arose as being changeful and based upon false perception. Not all nimittas are enamoring. Another common problem that meditators face is being startled and frightened by them. Prepare your mind with the knowledge that nothing can harm you. If something appears during your meditation and you're frightened by it, then your meditation will come to a halt. If that happens, 
Then bring up the recollection that there is no danger and let it go. Don't follow it. Or you may, if you wish, take up the nimitta and investigate its condition nature. After you've experienced these things a number of times, you'll be unmoved by them. They'll just be normal, nothing to worry about. There is, however, a class of nimittas that skilled meditators can use to intensify their practice. These include the mental images of parts of the physical body that appear to emerge and expand from within the mind particularly those that occur after the mind emerges from a deep state of samadhi. Such images are significantly more vivid than any that could be produced by ordinary imagination. Contemplation of them, especially visions of the body in a state of decay, can produce a deep insight into the conditioned nature of phenomena, which in turn may lead to a deep dispassion and abandoning attachment to the sense of an embodied self. These potent images are much more likely to arise if the meditator had already devoted time to investigating the body as a discursive meditation. Lung Po said that whether or not nimittas could be made use of in the cultivation of wisdom was dependent on the maturity of the meditator. Often he would recommend a meditator ignore a nimitta, even if it was of the physical body. One day, a lay meditator came to pay his respects to Lung Po and seek his guidance. He said that while meditating, he would see his body appear as a bleached skeleton floating in front of him. Lung Po explained to him that this is what the path of purification refers to as the Uggahanimitta, the acquired image. But rather than going on to explain how to manipulate the object in the way the text recommends, he said that there was no need to do so. It was sufficient to create the conditions of stability and calm lucidity for wisdom to do its work. When the mind had been primed by samadhi in this way, any object that arose in the mind was experienced as if it was a question, and the immediate recognition of it as impermanent, unsatisfactory and not-self appeared as an effortlessly correct answer. All that is called for is that you calm the mind sufficiently to provide a foundation for vipassana. When wisdom has arisen, then, as soon as anything occurs in your mind, you are able to deal with it. There's a solution to every problem. You become aware of the problem and its resolution simultaneously, and the problem ends. The knowing is important. If a problem arises without a solution, then you're in trouble. You're not keeping up with what's happening. So you don't have to do a lot of thinking about it. The solution arises in the present moment, simultaneously with the problem, even about things that you've never thought about or considered before without you having to hunt around here and there looking for an answer. He returned to the point that he would make repeatedly with reference to nimittas. Having fully acknowledged the object with equanimity, then turn attention away from the object known to the knowing itself. By doing so, the object would dissolve. Don't run after externals, because if you do, then the image will just keep on expanding. Before you know it, the skeleton will have changed into a pig, and then the pig will become a dog, the dog a horse, the horse an elephant, and then they'll all get up and chase each other about. Be aware that what you perceive is a nimitta, the crust of the lucid calm. <laughs>